children, and welcome to my chamber. My name is Rotherick Gastblood, and I'm your host of Tales from the Dark Chamber. This week, we have a great show for you. Tales to make your skin crawl. Each week, my chambermate and I read a scary tale that we found on the internet, or perhaps left under some corpse. Either way, we think you're going to like it, and we're just dying for you to hear it. So sit right back, light a candle, and let's have a ghoul evening. Hey, Rothrick. Yes, Woody? Rothrick. Yes, Woody? Rothrick. Woody, we're not playing the guess what game again now, are we? Now, what is it you wanted to say? Do you realize this is the 26th episode we've done here on Tales from the Dark Chamber? Really? And it only seems like a million. Funny, Ricky. What was that, Woody? <laughs> Funny, Rothrick. I thought so. So what is your point, Woody? Well, we've been chambermates for some time now, right? Yes. And we know each other well enough, right? I would say that goes without saying, Woody. Well, happy anniversary. And? One episode late, that is. See, I've completely overlooked the fact that we've hit a milestone in our podcast. 25 episodes so far. Well, plus one. So, 26. 25. Plus one. 26, you ninny. So what is your point? So my point is, thank you all for listening these past few months, and please continue to listen as we bring you spine-tingling tales we found in Rothrick's desk drawer. Under some cops, Woody. Yeah, whatever. But we wish to thank all of our loyal listeners, and we want you to subscribe to our channel and to our YouTube channel at Tales from the Dark Chamber. Now on to this week's tales. We have a new author, Hillbilly Creeper, who has two tales for us tonight, Sleepy Drive and Mr. Cottontail. Enjoy! Sleepy Drive by Hillbilly Creeper Co-written by Tom In the foothills of North Carolina, there's an old house which stands on the end of an old dirt road called Sleepy Drive, and in this house there lives an old man. This old man doesn't say a word to anyone, won't even venture into town. He just lives alone and doesn't bother a soul. One day, as the old man was working in his garden, out in front of his yard, he noticed a young boy riding down the dirt road on his bicycle. The boy was without a care in the world. However, all wasn't so cheery when the little boy's bicycle chain abruptly broke, leaving the boy to sit flat on his behind on the dusty dirt road. The little boy was visibly distraught about his bike, and so witnessing this, the frail old man exited his house and approached the young boy, checking if he was okay. The man tussled the young boy's hair and began finding a solution to the current situation. It was temporary, but it meant that the boy would be able to ride his bike back home safely. That night, when the little boy got home and sat down to supper with his family, he realized that he had forgotten to thank the old man and resolved to do so the next day. The boy grabbed a container and cut a slice of pie for the kind old man, intending to show him his gratitude. When the boy got to his house, he knocked on the wooden door, but to his surprise, no one answered. The boy shrugged and placed the container on the porch railing with a note saying, Thank you for yesterday. As the little boy laughed, he figured he had time to kill and decided to go down to the lake for a bit, just to skip rocks. The young boy was having a good time at the lake, tossing the rocks and catching tadpoles, when he heard the voices of some known school bullies that happened to show up at the lake. They hadn't noticed him just yet. So as he turned and took note of the direction of the school boys were, he figured he should hightail it out of there, however. Before he could even attempt to escape, it was already too late. They had caught him in the act of leaving. These bullies stood dead in their tracks. The corners of their mouths rose up and they all began to swarm around the little boy like a pack of wild animals. They taunted and teased him and told him to take off all of his clothes. When he did, they grabbed his clothes and tossed them in the lake. Then they forced him to walk home in nothing but his underwear as they rode away with his bike as well. 
Cold and frightened and also covered in bruises, the little boy walked down Sleepy Drive and past the old man's house, where the old man came back down, took off his jacket, and draped it over the boy. He gave him the pie container back and thanked the boy for the pie. They were the only words he had ever spoken to anyone. Ever. Thank you. As the weekend ended, when the little boy went back to school, he noticed that one of the bullies was absent that day. The boy began to notice that with each day, one bully from the pack that had attacked him days earlier were now disappearing one by one, and the strangest part was no one knew why and where the boys were until there was none of them left to disappear. The next day, the town was in an uproar. Three missing young boys had turned up dead. Their bodies suffered horrific, mangled, and seemingly undefinable wounds. Complete disregard for their bodies, as there was no attempt in modesty or burials for the remains. Words too disturbing and shocking for this small town to even fathom. One bully was found retained and tied to a tree, stripped down to nothing but his underwear, and then the second one was found with a bicycle chain wrapped around his throat, strangled to death. Then the third and last bully was found lying on the side of the road with what appeared to be tire tracks across his stomach. It was front page in the town newspaper that day, and when the little boy saw this, it was as if a light bulb had clicked on in his head. It must have been the old man who did this. It had to be. After school had ended, the boy resolved to confront the old man, and so he made his way down to Sleepy Drive. Once there, he stood on the drive of the old man's lawn, gazing upon his house. The boy felt an air of eeriness. Something was off about the house. It was darker than it ever was before, and where there was a garden lay nothing but weeds. The young boy hesitantly walked up to the door. As he was about to knock, out of the corner of his eyes, he stumbled upon the note that was addressed to him. It was signed by, you guessed it, the old man. The boy gasped as he took in the words from the note. Thank you for your act of kindness, something that I haven't seen in a very long time. That act of kindness deserves a kindness one that only I can give you. Just remember this, young man. When they say an eye for an eye, they mean an eye for an eye. The little boy was horrified at the reasoning of the old man and that he had left it there. The boy began to question himself. Was there even an old man to begin with, or did he just imagine the whole thing? The boy composed himself and quickly left for home, got into bed, and never spoke to anyone about the old man or the old house that sat at the end of Sleepy Drive. Sleepy Drive by Hillbilly Creeper Co-written by Tom Mr. Cottontail by Hillbilly Creeper Co-written by Tom I don't know where I went wrong. It just started out as your ordinary test. Okay, before I get ahead of myself, let me explain a little. I work at a research center for a disease control and containment. My job was to create vaccines in case of emergency. In order to make sure nothing goes wrong, I tested the vaccine on several types of animals, mainly small animals. I know what you're going to say. Isn't testing on animals wrong and cruel? Yes, it is. However, I assure you that all animals we test are either old, sick, or dying. So what's the harm if they're dying anyway? One evening during my shift, I was stuck with my next project in my lab. Working on one of my newest vaccines, I went to test it on one of my animal subjects. The subject which I called Mr. Cottontail the Bunny. I took Mr. Cottontail and injected him with a serum to see if I could get the right reaction. Minutes after the injection, I sit and wait, but it appeared to have no effect on the test subject. Or so I thought. Several minutes with no sign my vaccine had the desired effect, I placed Mr. Cottontail back into his cage and went to the bathroom to take a leak. By the time I came back to my lab, I was shocked to see it in a torn-up mess. All the other animals' cages were ripped open and some of the other lab experiments had escaped, and as for the rest of them, their carcasses lay sprawled in bent cages, ripped to pieces by something. Blood and guts of animals lined the walls, the floor, the top of the benches, flesh wedged between the bars of the cages. The ones who did not die were already devouring the animal carcasses. Witnessing this scene brought bile to my throat. I nearly puked by reflex. I was in an immediate state of panic and shock. 
At the time, I didn't notice the only cage that was ripped open from the inside out, Mr. Cottontail's cage. I began thinking to myself, could this be some form of an extreme protest? Had a lunatic somehow broken into the lab? All sorts of things crossed my mind until Mr. Cottontail's cage came into view. I stood there utterly shocked and lost for words. Could this be the serum I injected him with? Could he be the one responsible for what happened while I was in the restroom? Is this my fault? What had I done? My questions were soon answered. In the corner of my eye, I saw something sitting there gnawing and chewing on one of the carcasses of the test animals. God, I wish I hadn't gotten a better look at that horrible scene. What was once Mr. Cottontail, a frail, sickly rabbit, now stood before me, a furious beast. Almost completely unrecognizable if it hadn't been for his defining ears and fluffy tail that I wouldn't have realized this beast was him. I had created a monster. Mr. Cottontail was no longer a cute, cuddly, soft bunny, but instead a freak of nature, and it was all my fault. I cautiously approached this creature, trying not to startle it and get myself killed in the process. As I made my way closer to him, all of a sudden his ears perked up and he turned around to face me. Once I came face to face with him, I knew this was not the same bunny that I had taken care of. Instead, this beast that I was looking at was no longer Mr. Cottontail. This thing had elongated teeth and its eyes were a golden yellow, almost reptilian in appearance. His once white fur was caked in fresh blood. I did not know what to do at this point, considering my situation is dire at best. So I slowly backed away, trying not to startle Mr. Cottontail. But for every step I took to distance myself, he took a step forward, drawing menacingly closer to me. I thought I was going to die by the claws of my own creation, until I heard this thing speak to me. I kid you not, it fucking spoke to me. Well, along the lines of one sentence, but that's more than it's ever spoken. It called me father. After I heard it say this, I tried to communicate with it, to see how far its speech patterns were, his intellectual capabilities. Mr. Cottontail, do you know where you are and do you know who I am? Soon enough, this thing replied, yes, I am at a test facility and you are my father. And how do you feel? I cautiously questioned him. He responded with, I feel great, Father. Thank you for making me better. I am no longer sick, but I do require a taste for blood and flesh now. I could not believe what I was hearing. Not only had I made him well again, but I also made him into a flesh-eating zombie-like monster. So I pondered on what I was going to do next with him. Then it hit me. I will tranquilize him and contain him in a much stronger cage. I will run more tests on him to see where I went wrong and where I can correct it. So slowly I reached for the tranquilizer gun. However, Mr. Cottontail noticed what I was doing and he did not like my actions. So he lunged at me, knocking the gun out of my hand. He began saying, You will not put me back in a cage. I will not allow this, Father. He escaped, lunging out of the window into the outside world. That happened days ago and I have been looking for him ever since. I haven't found him yet, but the police and news crews had found his victims. Ripped apart, their organs removed from their bodies, sometimes parts of their organs were devoured, never to be seen at the murder site. This is just total chaos now ever since he had escaped and began killing people. Either way, I will not stop until I find him and destroy him, because it's already too late to do anything else but kill him. Forget about science. Fucking forget about lab testing. I just need to find him and set things right. I think I know where he's headed next. I have read in the paper that the town zoo has a new shipment of female rabbits and it's only a matter of time. Mating season is almost here. I hope to God that his DNA is not genetically sound because one monster is enough. We definitely don't want a bunch of those fucking things running around and killing people. So if you see what appears to be a bunny, I don't care how you do it, kill it. At least try to before it kills you. Mr. Cottontail by Hillbilly Creeper Co-written by Tom Well, folks, that's our story tonight. Rothrick and I hope you enjoyed it. We sure had a great time bringing it to you, and we really appreciate you listening. Tune in next week when we bring you another chilling Tales from the Dark Chamber. And just a note, 
If you're an aspiring author and want your story read here on Tales from the Dark Chamber, send us a note at talesfromthedarkchamber at gmail.com. If it creeps old Rothrick out enough, we'll air it. And subscribe to our channel here for notification of our next new episode and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Remember, hit that like button and help us grow the channel. Also, make sure you tell your friends about us. Spread the word. If you want your story recorded for your own use or just want to have it, check out my website at wittygvoiceover.net. You can order there. And again, thank you for listening tonight.